thank you to everyone on Zoom and for those who are here in person to hear this. Um, and thanks to the Rockland Public Library and to M. Um, as independent authors, we rely a lot on our public libraries and on independent bookstores to help us talk about our work and, and get our work out there and have people learn about um, what independent authors in Maine are doing. And it's a, a wonderful and a large community. Um, you could spend your reading life reading books written by and about uh, Maine. So, so thank you, Em, for having me. Um, the first thing that, that you should know about me is that I am from away. And you can probably guess that from my accent. Um, as Em said, um, I grew up in South Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. And when my wife and I retired, we moved to Ocean Park, Maine, about 10 miles south of Portland. Um, the other thing you should know, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about me, um, is that I was adopted when I was three or four days old. Um, it cost my parents $125 to adopt me um, back in the day. I paid more to adopt our rescue dog than my parents paid to adopt me. Um, but it was just about a year and a half ago, um, because of the change in adoption laws and adoptees getting access to their original birth certificates, um, that I got mine uh, from the state of New Jersey and found out for the first time in my life who my birth mother was. Um, her name is on the birth certificate. Um, Question 18 on the original birth certificate is legitimate question mark. Mine is checked no. So I am, according to the state of New Jersey, um, illegitimate. But anyway, through that process, I discovered the one and only picture that I have ever seen of my birth mother when she was a teenager. Um, she was a teenager when she had me. But I saw that one picture, um, so I now have that kind of closure. She passed away um, a long, long time ago. But through seeing that one picture, uh, that one black and white picture of my birth mother, it probably unconsciously um, inspired part of this story um, in the Stones of Ilsa Craig, um, which involves at one point um, an old black and white photograph. So I certainly didn't make that conscious connection when I was writing, um, but in hindsight, that probably did inspire a part of this story. Um, the last thing that you <clears throat> probably should know about me is that I was a lawyer in a prior life. Um, I managed to escape from that particular hell um, <laughs> and moved on to work in a couple of nonprofits um, thereafter. I never set out to write a book. Never, never thought about it my whole life until a couple of years ago. Um, and when someone says or refers to me as an author or I have a quote unquote author event like this, it sounds funny to me because I don't picture myself that way. <clears throat> but anyway, that's um, what I turned out to be, I guess. And when I first had the notion to write a work of fiction, um, I had no idea really what to write about. And my wife suggested, why don't you write a story about curling? And I said, well, that's not a bad idea. Um, you're supposed to write what you know and what you love. So I wrote about curling set in Maine, uh, two things that I absolutely love. Um, so have any of you actually, I know you have, tried curling? Anybody else? OK, then I, I guess I have some work to do. You, you've, you've seen it on TV, I'm sure. Um, kind of strange people sliding down the ice and sliding these stones. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, the object of curling is to take this 40 pound stone made of 60 million year old Scottish granite and slide it down about 150 feet of ice to land it in what's called the house. It's basically a giant bullseye that's painted into the ice. Um, teams of four compete against each other. Each player throws two stones. 
and you, the stones are constantly banging into each other, moving other stones out of the way, jostling for position, and trying to get closest to the center of the bullseye to get their points. Um, they do that while wearing a special piece of equipment, and that is curling shoes. You see people sliding down the ice as they throw the stones, and their one foot is wearing this kind of shoe. The white that you see is Teflon, which enables the uh, shooter to slide along the ice with the stone. As you can imagine, Teflon on ice is a pretty slippery combination. Um, the other shoe has a rubber gripper on it so that you can remain upright. Most people manage to do. Um, it's a loud game. If you've ever seen one in person or even on television, um, the stones sliding down the ice and banging to, into each other is pretty noisy. And curling is nicknamed the roaring game, the roar in game, um, because of the noise the rocks made as they make as they slide along the ice. Um, the stone that you see all comes from one particular place, and that is the island of Ilsa Craig, which is pictured on the cover of the book, um, which is off the west coast of Scotland. Um, it used to be a volcano 60 million years ago, shortly after the dinosaurs became extinct. Pangea, uh, Pangea North America and Europe were breaking apart, uh, moving farther apart, and Ilsa Craig was one of the volcanoes that erupted back then as that was happening um, off the Scottish mainland. Um, and what it left when it cooled was the island of Ilsa Craig. Um, Ilsa Craig has never really been inhabited. It's pretty wild. It's mostly just rock. Um, the lighthouse keepers would live there, of course. They were the only ones, really. And some seasonal quarrymen uh, would live on the island harvesting um, granite. So there's a lighthouse. There's an old castle on the island built in the 1500s, never used, apparently. But apparently, the Scots built it um, to protect against a possible invasion by King Philip of Spain, which they were deathly afraid of. Um, the island has a number of caves on it. Uh, a couple hundred years ago, some quarrymen, presumably, were shoveling guano out of one of the caves, a decade's worth of guano. And they uncovered a couple of skeletons beneath the guano, um, believed to be um, from smugglers who used to use the island to, to store their contraband before moving it along uh, to the mainland. Anybody have any idea why folks would be shoveling guano out of caves back then? Well, there's two possible reasons. Uh, one is that there was a thriving guano trade around the world because guano is a fantastic fertilizer. Um, so people were buying and selling guano. Um, the other possible reason is that guano can be turned into gunpowder, which would have been very useful to people working in the quarries back then. So for one of those reasons, they were shoveling guano from the caves and came across these skeletons on Ilsa Craig. Um, so that's the story of the island. It used to be much bigger. The glaciers over the millennia have whittled it away and worn it down and left this tiny island really 800 feet high, um, only about two miles in circumference. So you could walk around the perimeter uh, in the morning if you were so inclined. Um, so learning about Elsa Craig and its connection to curling um, led to the book, The Stones of Elsa Craig, uh, which is a work of historical fiction. It's a novel. Um, And while it's centered around curling, 
the, some of the characters curl. Um, it's not about curling. It's really a novel about um, one person's, one man's um, loss and loneliness, um, obsession or series of obsessions and quest um, for vengeance. So curling is really the connective tissue that weaves the story together. Um, and there is a lot of history of curling in the book, um, history of Scotland in the book, and history of Belfast, Maine, where it is primarily um, set. It's a mystery, but it's a mystery that happens in plain sight. You know what's happening throughout the story. Um, as I said, it, it's set in present day Belfast, Maine, your neighbor to the north, um, and 1880s Scotland. Um, as a work of historical fiction, there are parts of the book that are true and parts of the book that are not true. Um, and I wanna read to you um, one, one little passage, which happens to be true. Um, and this is about Ilse Craig and the wildlife there. At one point, um, there were about half a million puffins who used to use Ilse Craig to nest and to breed. And something happened to the puffins um, long ago, and something happened to them again recently. So this is um, the story of one of the things that happened on Ilse Craig. My newfound fixation with curling and with Elsa Craig in particular led me to the story of the brown rats and their century of domination over animal life on the small island. In the 1860s, uh, there were upwards of 500,000 puffins nesting and breeding on Elsa Craig, half a million birds on that one small island. An ornithologist once claimed that if the puffins were disturbed, they caused a bewildering darkness in the sky furiously flapping their undersized wings. Passing ships would sometimes fire a gun to startle the birds so that they would all alight from the island, blacken the sky, and provide amusement and wonder for the passengers and crew. By 1935, however, each and every single puffin was gone, not to return for nearly 70 years. The birds were simply no match for the rats. The first reported rat on Elsa Craig was a brown rat, also known as a sewer rat, wharf rat, or Norway rat, sighted in 1889. However and whenever they got there, they flourished, with no predators save for the lighthouse keeper's dogs, which did not keep up with the reproductive prowess of the rats, and an unending food source in the eggs and chicks of hundreds of thousands of birds, the rats multiplied at an astonishing rate. Keepers reported that at night, from the gallery outside the lantern room, they could look down upon a virtual sea of brown rats scurrying about their business, their eyes glowing red from the reflected light. Brown rats, through no real fault of their own, are pretty nasty creatures. They can grow to be quite large, weighing in at a pound or more, and growing to be as long as 20 inches. They can and do eat almost anything, including insects, fish, and mice, although grains and seeds typically form the bulk of their diet. One researcher concluded, apparently after exhaustive study, that their favorite foods are scrambled eggs, macaroni and cheese, raw carrots, and cooked corn. Among their least favorite are beech, uh, beets, peaches, and celery, which is understandable. If brown rats are particularly hungry or can't find their favorite food, they will eat soap, paper, and beeswax. Brown rats will sometimes even hunt together as a pack and prey on poultry and young animals as large as baby sheep. So that is the um, true story of the brown rats. There's a somewhat happier ending due, due to um, human intervention. And that is about 30 years ago, some folks got together and decided they didn't want the brown rats and they wanted the puffins back. So they laced the entire island with warfarin the rats ate it, they all died within a year, there are no longer any rats there, and just within the past decade or so, the puffins have started to come back. Um, and there are now probably um, 30 to 50 pairs of puffins who come back each year 
and use Elsa Craig as a nesting site. So I guess that's a, a somewhat happier story than uh, a couple hundred thousand brown rats running around. Um, Um, as, to, as to writing, um, I chose historical fiction because I love research and I love the science and I, I like history. Um, so there is lots of research that goes into writing historical fiction. Um, I spent hundreds of hours um, reading old books about Scotland, old um, curling club minutes, of the history of curling. Um, there is an actual database in Scotland that you can access and see all of these old newspaper accounts from the 1700s and 1800s about curling and some of the matches that took place. Um, and I love that. I read one book called Stargazing, which was written 20 or 30 years ago by a man who actually served as an apprentice lighthouse keeper on Elsa Craig. Um, and he tells the story of what it is like on a remote, uninhabited island, um, working as a lighthouse keeper. Um, so much of it is accurate and historical, the historical part of fiction. Other parts are just made up. The great thing about historical fiction as an, an author is that if you get something right and somebody comes up to you and says, yeah, I, I know about that place or I know about that event, my, relative, lived there, or did that. Um, so if you get it right, that's great. And you can say, well, yeah, that's meticulous, painstaking research and, and uh, finding out what is true and what isn't. The other part is if you get something wrong, which we all do, um, you can say, well, that's the fiction part. I made that, I made that up. <laughs> so that you, you have an out either way. Um, As I mentioned, the book is set largely in present-day Belfast, Maine, which I'm sure um, many of you, if not all of you, have been to. Do you know what Belfast is most famous for historically? Chickens. Chickens, exactly. Um, at one point, Belfast was probably the chicken processing capital of the world. Um, there were dozens of poultry processors in Belfast. One of the things they did was all of the unused parts of the chickens, talons, beaks, feathers, guts, were drained completely untreated through these large pipes right into the bay. Um, some divers, scuba divers, have reported that if you go down to the bottom of Belfast Bay, you will see, you know, layers and layers of beaks and talons and chicken bones and all those, those um, wonderful things. The chicken processors left, obviously, um, many years ago. Uh, environmental laws changed. Um, land and labor was cheaper in the South. Uh, so they abandoned uh, Belfast. But one of the things that happened in Belfast was the broiler festival, which they had in mid 1900s. This is um, a true story um, about broiler day beginning in 1948. In 1948, Belfast decided to hold broiler day, which was so successful it inspired a second even larger broiler day in 1949. The second event attracted some 2000 people, including the governor, and a host of quote unquote celebrities from the poultry world who together consumed 3,000 pounds of chicken barbecued over an 80 foot long pit. A broiler queen was named, uh, chosen on the basis of poise, personality, and appearance. The first broiler queen, 16 year old Betty Perry, wasn't even from Belfast, but rather from the neighboring town of Lincolnville. Governor Frederick Payne himself placed the cardboard crown atop her head. Betty Perry later gushed that it was the most wonderful day of her life. Molly and I, Molly being the narrator's wife, Molly and I arrived in Belfast a few decades too late to enjoy Broiler Day. Being named Broiler Queen made Betty Perry famous. 
It lifted her out of deep poverty, where her mother had sewn dresses for her, quite ironically, from chicken feed sacks. Her family was so poor that they used newspapers for wallpaper. After being crowned the first broiler queen, Betty Parry toured the country with the other Maine queens, and you can probably guess who they are. The potato queen, the blueberry queen, the lobster queen, and Miss Maine, although Miss Maine wasn't technically a queen. Why Susie Knight, the 1949 Maine sardine queen, did not get to tour with them is unclear since the main sardine industry was nearly as large as lobster industry at the time. It is quite likely that Betty Perry was the first Mainer to appear on television, promoting, of course, Maine broilers. Molly stumbled across a story about the broiler festival and the naming of a broiler queen one time in Down East magazine. She gave it to me to read. When I was finished, we talked a little about the festival and the article and what the city must have been like back then. Later that night, Molly looked up from her book and asked me, do you think that I could have been a broiler queen? This struck me as one of those questions which was really not meant to be, a, which was really just meant to be a conversation starter, not a serious question. So I said, well, you have the poise, looks, and legs for it, but I don't know about the personality part. Apparently, that was not the answer that Molly was hoping for. She called me a rather unflattering name and went back to her book. So that is the true story about Betty Perry and the Broiler Festival and the Broiler Queen. Um, the other timeline in the book, and there are two timelines going on, um, is set in late 1800s Scotland. And in doing all this historical research, as, as anyone does looking into a different time and place, you see how times have changed and sensibilities have changed. And so this is also um, a true, true account from an 1826 Scottish newspaper, so 198 years ago. And it's pretty indicative of how times have changed. Um, what I will tell you is that the reporter begins by reporting factually and at one point changes um, into offering commentary. 1826. On Tuesday last, 28 blooming damsels met on Del Petter Lock in the parish of Sankar to play a friendly bonspiel. Bonspiel is a curling tournament. Um, they formed themselves into two teams, and although wading up to the ankles in water, seemed to enter into the spirit of the game and to contest it with as much intense anxiety as if the question that the losing party should all die old maids depended upon the issue. At the conclusion of the game, neither party became victors, the number of shots having been equal. Many individuals of the other sex were attracted to the scene of action. And as the ladies, like true curlers, had resolved to adjourn to the toll house where a het pint had been ordered, they kindly invited the gentlemen to accompany them. It soon became a matter of doubt if this was of sufficient potency to counteract the bad effects resulting from wet feet. And as tea could not be expected to prove more efficacious, our heroines resorted to whiskey toddy. And through its inspiration, a dance was proposed. And the ball was kept up with great vigor until far into the wee hours of the morning. <clears throat> and this is where the reporter changes to offering commentary rather than a factual account. <clears throat> It may be true that there is no good reason why females should not have their hours of recreation as well as men, but it seems advisable that those recreations which they do engage in should be of a character befitting their sex. Ice playing is certainly not a game of this description. It has nothing feminine pertaining to it, either in theory or practice. If therefore prudence and propriety are to be consulted, the fair maidens of the lower end of Sankar Parish will not again resort to the same expedient for obtaining a day's relaxation and enjoyment. I think that most of the women curlers that I know and probably half, close to half of the members of our club and half the members of the Belfast Club are probably um, women who are just as accomplished in, in curling as most of uh, the men that I know who do it. And that would include, in the book, um, there is a foreword by a woman named Tara Peterson, 
who was on the 2022 United States Olympic curling team. Um, I don't know Tara personally, and this is a commentary on uh, kind of the curling community and, and how close we are and, and what a um, collegial kind of atmosphere is involved in curling. When I had finished a, a draft of the book, I tracked her down a bit like a stalker would because um, these people don't generally want you to know their personal contact information. But anyway, I got a hold of her via email and asked her if she might like to read a, a manuscript. And she said, sure. And a couple weeks later, she wrote back and she said she liked it. I said, well, if you like it, do you want to write a foreword? And she agreed. So the foreword to the book is by um, Tara Peterson, in which she announces that um, her team intends to, to try to qualify and get into the 2026 Olympics, which are going to be held um, in, in Italy next time around. Um, so that is really um, the story of the book and the story of the Stones of Elsa Craig and a little of the history of curling in Scotland and Belfast, Maine. Um, I'm certainly open to any questions any of you may have. I know I talked to some of you beforehand, but I'm sure you have some other questions about curling or the book? People in the room here, you've got any questions? Yes. Um, I guess so. It just occurred to me that when they first curling was first invented, that you can only do it. It's on ice, so it was you didn't do it in the summertime. Right? Yep. So now you can do it year round, but originally it would only have been a wintertime sport. Originally it was played outdoors. Um, it was invented in Scotland probably um, in the early 1500s. Um, there is a curling stone that was found and they looked nothing like this. They were rocks that people picked up and decided to play with those. Um, some would cut finger holes into them, kind of like a bowling ball. Um, and use it that way. So they found one in Scotland with the date 1511 when they drained a pond. Um, and the people who found it had the foresight to take it to the closest museum, which is the Smith Museum in Stirling, Scotland. And they recognized it for what it was and they still have it. And you can go see a 500 and some year old curling stone at that museum in Scotland. But yes, it was always played outdoors. It was always dependent on the weather um, until people figured out how to use refrigeration and make indoor curl. So it sounds like there's a lot to be learned from your book. So of all the factual information that you dug up, how much did you know already? And how much did you have to learn just to write the book? Um, I knew virtually nothing of the history or about Ilsa Craig and about the stones. Um, so all of that history, um, like the 1511 curling stone, I learned from the research. What I also learned and what I didn't mention in the presentation is the stone itself and why um, stones are made from this particular granite. Um, all of the granite comes from Ilsa Craig. Um, the blue hone granite is only found on that island, and that is the key to making the best curling stones in the world. Blue hone granite was left behind when the volcano cooled, and someone discovered that that granite is particularly um, impervious to water penetration, so it's used for curling stones. Water can't seep into the stone while it's on the ice, freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, and damage the rock. Um, so that's why Ilsa Craig is, is uh, granite is used for curling stones. Um, these stones will last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, maybe just one more question. You spoke of the, the uh, fraternity that grows up around curling. Any other stories about connections that you made after writing the book or, or maybe during that uh, connected with people who you hadn't known or um, there, there are quite a few I appeared on, as you listened into, apparently, uh, Main Calling. I did a 
one hour curling show um, with the president of the Belfast Curling Club. Um, the Belfast Curling Club, which I do not belong to, has invited me to a few bond spiels, tournaments, and I've, I've talk to folks from around the country who come to these tournaments about curling and, and learn so much from them. Um, Eve Muirhead was the gold medalist in the 2022 Olympics. Um, she is ironically from Scotland um, and, and they won it. She read a manuscript as well and, and liked it and offered an endorsement. Um, Nina Roth, who was the, in essence, the captain of the US women's curling team uh, read it and offered an endorsement. So I've met just so many great people um, locally and, and internationally just because of curling. Well, thank you so much to join, for joining us, David, and thank thanks you. so much everyone for coming as well. Thank you.